Welcome, one and all, to the Damage Board. I'm John Derulo. It's a big old Friday show, which means Brett Ehrlich joins us now. Brett, host of the Happy Half Hour, how are you doing? I'm doing so how good. How are you? How are you? Thanks, Tobias. I'm doing well. I'm having a great time this morning. I uh, thank you, John, and everyone who participated in the Pride special yesterday. It was so good. Thank you. And it was Alyssa's first solo special it as was. producer. And really putting the pro in producer. So congrats to everybody. <laughs> it was a great, it was a great special. And with it, we actually ended all the boycotts on Pride merchandise. <laughs> Congratulations, TYT. It was you who got it done. Da, 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 da. Yes, it was awesome. Listen, did a great job. We had great guests. I will say uh, all of our non-election day specials always end up feeling too short. This one in particular. My segment felt like it was two and a half minutes long. Like right, it was but that's how and done. But that's how TV works. I mean, we can get into the specifics of how these clips perform when posted on VOD, but uh no, that's how it's that's how TV feels. It should feel like you're all very efficiently covering the topics. And mm-hmm. by doing it at that pace, it actually it it moved. I like that the special it did move. And everybody move. got their thing in and it was great. Yeah, crazy. I'd word that differently, but yes, uh, it moved, and I think some people were moved. I think I think we did our job. Anyway, uh, thank everybody who watched, and those of you who didn't, what the hell? Big problem. Anyway, um, we got a lot that we're going to be talking about through the course of today. For those of you on the linear platforms or listening on the podcast, you don't know what I'm talking about right now, but we're going to be throwing away our garbage people of the week. If you, like me back in the day, back when I used to just listen to the Young Turks as a podcast for like five years, You may not know, we do our garbage people every single Friday. Have you been missing it this whole time? What horrible life decisions you've made. Anyway, go to the YouTube page and you can watch the other content that happens in the aftermath that unfortunately doesn't make it into the podcast. Um, For the rest of you, just uh, buckle up. It'll be coming. And along the way, we got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Some of it's serious and important. Some of it's just fun. It's Friday. Can we have some fun? That's a serious question. Are we allowed to? I'm honestly not sure anymore. Who but we're wants try to try anyway? Some... Yeah, there's a great. Yes, me. I do. John, I'm sorry. I interrupted. Second Yay. Time. He wants to have fun. So we're going to be doing that in a little bit. Along the way, please send us your comments, your tweets, your super chats, your jokes, your incisive questions, your observations, your breaking news. There will be no Blue Apron gift cards for the time being, but hopefully someday they will return. Um, and with all that said, Brett, you ready to start this thing? Yeah, I'm ready. The reason we don't have Blue Apron gift cards is because uh, the administrative person who, or the person who has a lot of responsibilities in addition to the administration of that that perk, uh, is getting married and on vacation. So that is nice. Oh, so that is awesome. She's gone when she's back. We'll have yeah. it. That's the kind of that is uh, great it's, redundant um, support we have here at TYT. <laughs> <laughs> it is too bad that for her to have her time off, other people have to go hungry. Yeah, that's too bad. But anyway, I'm kidding. It'll be it'll be back before you know it. Okay, with that said, let's have some fun. Let's start off with this. I've got a long last name, uh, European name, Steinhauser. There's been some confusion over your last name and the pronunciation, and I'm just wondering, to correct the record, what is it? Oh, that's ridiculous, these stupid things. Listen, the way to pronounce my last name, winner. (laughs) He even pronounced that wrong. It's pronounced wiener. It is definitely pronounced wiener. That's uh, Rob DeSantis (laughs) or DeSantis. I don't know because he won't just pick a name and then say your name, say your name, just say it. If you think that this is a stupid thing, and look, I think objectively this is a stupid thing for us to be focusing on, I suppose, then just finish it by saying your name, whichever it is that you want. Honestly, uh, he's, you know, his family's Italian in origin or whatever. Uh, what was it originally pronounced like back in the homeland? I don't know. He probably doesn't either. But if he wants it to be DeSantis or DeSantis, he can. My name, what's my name? Most of you probably don't even know. It's John Iderola. Do you think anyone pronounced it that way back in Italy? Hell no. Nobody did. There was like seven more A's in it. Um, So you do get to choose. And I give you that right, Rob DeSantis. You know why? Because I think that if somebody wants to identify in a particular way, it is merely polite to just do it. You know, but you don't believe that, do you? You've given us license to make a big old deal about this. And then you continued it with that ridiculous call me winner thing. Not going to call you that. What do you think, Brett? 
it's De Santis. That's how you would say it in Italy. De Santis. Mm. Se chiama De Santis. <laughs> I avoid Yaderola. That's how you would say it. Depending on what mm. region you are, Yaderola. That's what you would say. I don't know. You've told me where you're from before, but like there's, there's Italy until very recently was like a hundred countries. And yes. so, like, they all had their own languages. Different regions were uh, influenced by, depending on where you are, like France or like Northern Africa. Like, it depends. A lot of places had a lot of flags. It's like the six flags of countries. Um, it's the Texas of countries. Bum, bum, it, bum, 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 bum. It's basically <laughs> like that. That's the national anthem. But of like, Italy. D- the one thing I take away from this. So, what DeSantis wanted to do going into that interview was to come off as this guy who is very has a lot of prowess, is confident, and is cool and above it all, and tries to do a, literally exactly what would Trump do in this situation. But he doesn't have the swag. He doesn't have nope. the charisma. So he just comes off. As a wiener, a wiener, hundred percent capital W wiener. Yeah, uh, that thing of like, so which what Trump is doing in trying to switch which way the change in his pronunciation went is just messing with him, and and you could really interpret it as a test. And the way he's responding, he thinks it's like, nah, I'm not going to descend to that level. I'm focused on winning. It is so Jeb. You are being so Jeb right now. The way you're being is maybe, maybe it's reasonable, I guess, on some level. Maybe it's mature and by comparison, but it ain't strong. It's not going to end the attacks against you. He is demonstrating every day that he doesn't have it. Yeah. And if I was one of his donors, I would be looking at stuff like that. And honestly, I'd be as scared by stuff like that. As like the attacks against his prior support for cutting Social Security, because both are strong indications that this guy just is not going to be able to get through this primary. Yeah, Final watching thoughts. DeSantis respond to accusations from Trump is like watching the Washington Generals play against the Globe Trotters. Like, yeah, it is. Ron DeSantis is playing yesterday's game. He's tr- but and, and he's heard of today's game. The Trump game, which is not to apologize, not to give the politician a response, but that kind of uh, like leading man, uh, star of the reality show swagger is something that Trump has. And yeah. it's something that DeSantis is doing a crappy impression of. Yeah. You know what it's like? It's like he was in this small pond. And I don't even just mean that it was a state level thing like Florida. The pond was. I just have to attack the Democrats or the left or whatever. I can say whatever I want about them. It doesn't even matter if they respond because my base is not going to listen to them. So I can just say whatever I want. It's easy mode. And now he's going to the big wide world. It's like if you ever like maybe back in the day, you'd play like local multiplayer games against your friends and maybe you thought you were really cool. And then you you go online and you realize, oh, dear God, there are people who take this stuff seriously. That's what he's finding out. This is not just attacking Disney for funsies or whatever. You'll get hit back and he's just not ready to defend himself. But like what Trump is even explicitly saying is do you want the original or do you want a weak impression of the original? Mm -hmm. That's what the pack is actually saying. And that is the literal question. Like you spoke truer than you purposed. That is the question facing the Republican electorate. And the Republican electorate, a lot of them do want a sheep impression of Trump because they definitely don't want all that Trump brings with him. Now, the question is, are there enough of those? And are the people who give like the high profile campaign style uh, personalities, are they going to yeah. give permission to the electorate to vote for that sheep impression of Trump? Or will it cost them too much? To publicly turn against the Donald because they're all just trying to see which way the wind is blowing and go with the strongest one. And and it's too much of a risk. Trump has wisely but clumsily and horribly made it too high a price to kind of try to yeah. appeal to both sides. Yeah, uh, I, I, I have basically no expectations from anymore. Um, I'm hoping maybe Chris Christie can punch him a few times. That'll be fun. We'll see. He tried, man. He tried, anyway, but they all are on camera saying, I no, Trump's awesome. Sure, but I think 
it has been many years. We'll see if Chris Christie has learned anything in the interim. We'll find out. Anyway, uh, I want to move to uh, arguably more important information. So why don't we get ready for our B block? President Biden appears to be triumphant when it comes to his debt deal. The Senate passed it. He's going to be signing it later on today. And he's in fact going to be giving a rare Oval Office address about the success in getting it passed. I'm assuming there will be a good amount of gloating. Uh, up until this point, he's been pretty restrained as it got closer to passing the House, then eventually passed the House. It's passed the Senate. He really hasn't been saying much. Perhaps it's part of the deal that he has with Kevin McCarthy that he's not supposed to gloat too much so that Kevin McCarthy won't get attacked by the Republicans too much. I'm not sure, but it passed late last night in the Senate after receiving broad support in the House this week. In fact, receiving more support from Democrats in the House than from the Republicans. It suspends the debt ceiling for two years and cuts back on spending. Those are the literal words in the New York Times. Oh, but there's so much meaning and cuts back on spending. If you want all the details, we of course went through those details multiple times throughout this week. Those videos are up on the channel right now. I just wanted to show you a few of the votes because there were Democrats who voted against this. Uh, Bernie Sanders, perhaps not surprisingly, he's been critical of the deal, as has John Fetterman. But I wasn't sure that Elizabeth Warren or Jeff Merkley or Ed Markey would vote against it. Um, that was just how the screen grab was cropped. But I love that it fits in that, of course, Kirsten Sinema is perfectly happy with all this. But anyway, it's going to happen. There's not going to be you know, the collapse of the economy, at least not for that reason. Stay tuned for other possible reasons. And effectively, the government will be cut for the next couple of years. Brett, what do you think? I mean, yeah, this is... And to summarize what the prevailing position is on the actual left, uh, this is more evidence to the uniparty system where... Uh, you, you, if you look at how the party is itself, like the actual people who classify themselves as Democrats, and then you pull folks on a, on a wide swath, a lot of people are way to the left of what this decision means. Um, and it seems like Joe Biden, the same guy who historically has been like kind of where Ronald Reagan is legislatively and economically, just kind of proved it. That he's like, listen, I think it's smart for us not to spend money on social programs um, when really he didn't fight the good fight in this situation. He didn't fight the fight that says, listen, I don't need to listen to you. We already approved all of this spending and all of this spending yeah. goes to stuff that people in my party, the people who voted for me, wanted. But instead, Biden is giving into what he prioritizes a lot higher, it seems, which is this air of bipartisanship being paramount. When in reality, what he's doing is cutting wildly popular programs, even if you keep the, sp the spending at the same levels. Because yeah. of inflation, like you can't, uh, be, when inflation happens, then if you gave $100 to a program today, Next year, it's only going to be worth ninety-seven dollars uh, in that year's, you know, real dollar amount. Exactly. Yeah, and we're locked in now for a couple of years on that, and no closer to breaking free of this cycle. You know, he had said, "I can't do the Fourteenth Amendment because there's just not time," which is, of course, ignoring the fact that he could have started earlier. But let's say that you accept that. Well, now you've got two and a half years or whatever. So let's no. let's get on it. Let's get ready. Saying he time? has no time is absolutely insane. You know how I know? We had on the show, the channel Unbossed, we had our debt ceiling explainer done two months ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like this yeah. is well, they could have raised it in December. Everybody saw coming, which he's just saying: A, I've got no time for the Constitution, and B, I wasn't prepared. But yeah. we all know the real answer is: or it's again, I don't mind cutting programs that help millions of Americans. Yeah. Well, uh, with that, uh, we'll see what his comments are. We'll probably be covering them Monday on the show. Will they be the Monday menace? Stay tuned to find out next week. But for now, we're going to take our first break. We come back. Uh, Donald Trump had an even friendlier town hall. We'll cover that after this. I don't know the reference you're making, sir. Anyway, uh, with that said, let's have some fun starting at 1019.
Nice, let's jump into this. In just a moment, the leading presidential candidate for the Republicans, Donald J. Trump, will be with us for the full hour. By the way, unlike fake news CNN, it's not my job to sit here and debate the candidate. We're gonna ask him about the issues of the day that actually matter to the people that came out here tonight in the, in the rain and thunder and lightning, the voters, and they will also have their questions as well. Nothing is off the table. Yeah, but isn't it? Follow up questions appear to be off the table. Fact checks definitely off the table. The table is pretty much cleared so that Donald Trump can just lay on it and just gyrate in conspiracy theories and lies and misinformation without being obstructed in any way. I get that Sean Hannity is going to make a statement like that because he wants to like lord it over, like, see, like, look, CNN was so mean to him, but I'm not going to be. But it's also like, like you thought I was a journalist? What the hell's wrong with you? I'm just gonna let him loose, buddy. Brett, what do you think? Well, it's just like he dis he proved that he is gonna lay down and let Trump do whatever he wants. When he used Trump-ish the language in his setup to how the night's gonna go. Fake news CNN. Mm -hmm. Like we know what is happening. We've seen the previous interviews you've done with a guy when it's just one-on-one, -on -one and your job is to challenge him on things when that is a journalist interviewing a president, if you go with uh, what he'd have you believe about him. Um, and, and he's laid over and just let, laid down and let Trump walk all over him. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely what's gonna happen tonight. But that's just my conjecture, John. I think you've done the research to discover whether that actually took place. And I'm sure you've got plenty of videos for us. Exactly. Well, I can say that uh, we're gonna have a little bit of Hannity receiving some pushback despite he, he's he's already announcing I am gonna be pudding soft. And like he's also signaling to them, if I ever raise anything that seems critical, it's probably setting up a strong man so that Donald Trump can knock it down. But even so, that audience has been trained to be so sensitive and so like ready to sniff out disloyalty because all of them, their entire stock and trade is identifying people who are disloyal to Trump. And so you're you're raising them to do that. So he's going to be struck down by it a little bit, but um, but I do like him admitting before a live studio audience that he's not a journalist. He has no aspirations to be. That said, um, why don't we jump into one of the first questions? It actually has to do with the classified documents, the big revelation from earlier this week. News, News broke, broke yesterday yeah. that there might be a tape recording that quote where you acknowledge that you understood yeah. that these were classified documents. First of all, do you know who this call may be with? Do you know anything no, about it? No, I don't know it? anything about it. All I know is this. Everything I did was right. We have the Presidential Records Act, which I abided by 100%. Biden has 1,850 boxes with a lot of classified stuff that he's not supposed to have. In his case, I have the right to declassify as president. He's got 1,850 boxes that he doesn't want anyone to see. He had seven or eight boxes in Chinatown. In Washington, D.C., where nobody even speaks English in Chinatown. Chinatown is very, it's, it's in favor of China. And he has boxes in Chinatown. They took those boxes and they sent them to Boston to his lawyer. So his lawyer could look through them and probably do things that you're not supposed to do. Dear God, it's time for Grandpa to go to bed. The Chinatown thing? What in the hell did he get off on on that that nobody speaks they're, they're, they like China. they like China. I'll say that. Jesus, that's dude. like saying little Havana loves Castro. <laughs> like, yeah, I, uh, are you speaking a lot of Mandarin God. in Chinatown? No, like a lot of people are here because they didn't like China. <laughs> yeah, I. It's super weird, but anyway, I guess that that's a distraction, I suppose. So uh, Biden has documents which he's not supposed to have, even though he's present. So theoretically, he can telepathically declassify them. I guess it doesn't work for him. I guess the power went away. The magic was gone after Trump left office. Um, that defense right there was utterly pathetic. It was barely a defense. He didn't say that conversation didn't take place. He certainly didn't respond to the, to the content of it if it did play, take place. All he said was, I'll say this, everything I did was good. Literally. The crowd, the crowd began to cheer. Every, everything I've ever done is good. That's your defense? <laughs> what if Hunter said that? Would you buy that as a defense? Um, so anyway, and by the way, I, there <laughs> plenty of room for follow-up questions, Brett, but we know we're not going to get them because Hannity already announced that he's not a journalist and he's not there to provide any pushback.
Right. And it's the strong, it's like, I'm just going to set you up to do whatever you want and then say that you've answered the question when the question wasn't a real question you would give in an interview. And then Sanity is completely wrong to say that it's not his job to debate the candidate. It's it's his job to challenge the candidate to be the voice that uh, you know moderates the discussion. So keeping it on track, making sure to get clarification or clarification necessary. I think if the tables were turned and Fox had say Bernie Sanders on which they've had in the past in town hall settings and those moderators they gave up later because they realized Bernie was winning but mm-hmm. they tried to hold Bernie to task same with even Pete Buttigieg they they have these uh, they make the they they don't have a consistent um standard for how they treat candidates that's agnostic of their party it's absolutely yeah. based on partisanship and we all re- always already knew that yeah 100% um yeah I like uh, by the way at the end the projection of uh well he he had the boxes and so he probably did what people do like we, we already like Hannity didn't even mention that there were all those revelations about uh, was it there wasn't Taco Pina was it Taco no no it wasn't Taco Pina it was the other Trump lawyer who's like uh he went in and was uh, asking about searching other places and the aides were like trying to direct him away from searching certain places and then they cleared out the documents the day before the DOJ got there like these are really great areas to ask follow up questions about uh but we're not going to get those because Sean Hannity doesn't want to get booed still he is going to get a little bit of pushback from the audience when he makes what I think is a, is a pretty simple and maybe even helpful suggestion to Trump I've asked you this question before and it comes up a lot. People know that I, I've interviewed you all these years. I've, I've known you almost 30 years. And people ask me and, and say to him, why does he have to fight so hard? Why doesn't he pick his fights a little more? Why does he have to call people names? It's going to come down to those people that maybe are in the middle a little more. And the argument that they make to me is if he would just tone it down a hair, stop a little of the name calling. Hang on. I said it's their question. Leave me alone. All right. Um, that that it might help you with swing voters and and that are needed for you to get over the finish line. I was under investigation and under siege, and so were my people. And if I wasn't tough, I wouldn't be here right now. I guarantee you that. If I didn't fight back, I wouldn't be here. Oh God. Man, Sean Hannity, that's that's your audience, dude. That is the audience you tried to create, the audience that would provide that sort of reaction. He also, by the way, like we we some people I think accept that uh, because these people are on the news, they're on TV, they wear ties and they get paid a lot of money that like they're intelligent or whatever. But look at the way that he diffused his own question before asking it. He wants to make a point. I just think you should be less like super immature and insulting and he provided an out before even getting to that point of the question by saying why does he fight so hard this isn't about fighting hard or being tough this is about pointless self-destructive immaturity and vulgarity that's the point that you want to make and you provided him an out which he used and said i i had to fight hard i was under siege you don't have to make mocking insulting comments to fight hard when you're under siege but that's what Hannity did what do you think Brett yeah, he he's it's fascinating that that question was in there. Um and that you have to ask yourself why. One possibility is that it's so Hannity can sleep at night, but I just don't believe that. Like here is my question. I think it was because that is a real fear that the Trump campaign staff and um the folks who kind of have an understanding of how this campaign's going to play out and an understanding of what happened in 2020 in the, in the presidential election, that's what they're actually most afraid of. They're most afraid of Trump fatigue. Uh, mm-hmm. That folks just think about Trump and they're like, why is it always something horrible all the time? And that's a question for independents who explicitly voted for Biden on that grounds alone. But what he expects to get from Trump in the conversation that would appease that the people that have that fear or you know allay any of the fears that they have, I don't know what Hannity yeah. even expected from that. I think he understood that he needed to phrase it very delicately. And that's why he had all those caveats and and strange rhetorical approaches. 
that that he put all together in that question, as you point out. I think I think it was honest. I think he actually thinks Trump would do better if he toned down some of that stuff. And I think it's not a guarantee that he's right, but I think he's probably right. I don't know how much of a difference it could make at this point because there's so much baked in history with Trump, but uh, maybe it would have been enough in 2020. You know? That that echoes what you covered yesterday, I think, about um, Roger Stone and how he approaches conversations with Trump. Like That is how Hannity thinks he can swing Trump to be like, you know, actually, it's a great point. I'm not going to push back as much as I do. But he, he's never going to do that. And he shouldn't. I mean, this guy was caught on tape saying he grabs women by their genitals. Yeah. And most politicians would have completely backtracked forever on that. And whenever they... Someone brings it up, they would say, listen, it was my lowest point. He he did it for like 40 seconds and then realized that the dominant strategy, given how he's changed the media landscape during an election, is is just to be as horrible strongly as possible. Well, um, let's give Hannity a little break and let Trump turn his ire to actually a lot of conservatives when you really think about it. Take a look at this. The country has gone sick. It's gone sick. And I don't like the term woke because I hear woke, woke, woke. You know, it's like just a term that use half the people can't even define it. They don't know what it is. I'm not a fan of LeBron James, but I said, you know, if I were the coach of a woman's basketball team, I would have the greatest team. I'd say, uh, LeBron, would you like to become a woman? <laughs> And, and I go to another four or five big guys and I'll say, how about we will be undefeated for many, many years. There will never be anything like it. I'll, have the great, I'll, be, I'll go down as the greatest coach in history. They'll say I was the greatest ever. No, it's so crazy. And that's all woke. You know, that's all I guess they define that as woke, but that's all woke. That's Donald Trump at one of his many appearances in Iowa that he's been going to recently, uh, demonstrating that his prior claims, I mean, they were laughable, that he was gonna be the most pro-LGBTQ community, like community president ever. He said that back during the 2016 campaign. He's gonna be a different sort of Republican. Uh, no, he's gonna be exactly what he thinks he needs to be to get through a Republican primary, which is absolutely vicious and heartless and cruel. And in doing so, he also, I think, uh, humorously slams all the right wingers who just use the word woke for anything they're opposed to. By the way, he's one of those people. He went on later that day to use woke in the same exact ill-defined, vague, convenient way that he's attacking other conservatives for. But he's also demonstrating there, Brett, how easy it is to eat Ron DeSantis' lunch. Like Ron DeSantis' whole thing is being the anti-woke guy. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. It doesn't have to be based in fact. All it just has to be is cruel and repetitive. Um, anyone can do it. Any Republican can do it. He can do it. And so, what do you think? Trump is so fascinating because it seems like he only picks. He will absorb good points, and he then, like, he absorbs the good point that a lot of people on the right can't define woke, and that there's a lot of viral videos that came through his Facebook feed mm -hmm. where they asked, "Tell me what woke is," and he knows that people can't define it. But what Trump's specific, one of Trump's specific talents is to sound like he's incorporating the lesson into his stance, but he's not really. He's just kind of acknowledging it and vaguely cast, using that good point to disparage someone who threatens him, in this case, DeSantis, as you point out. But he still sticks by it. Later, he's in that same response. He says woke like three times. And I yeah. think this is the middle of a process he's in. And at the end of that process, he's just going to have a different word for woke that allows an indifferent kind of tight two minutes that he says over and over again, and he's working it out on the road. But once he has that bit, it's going to be a bit that's allowing him to say that we should still be anti-woke without saying the word woke, but also differentiate himself from DeSantis, who's gone psychopath and tried to kill a cartoon. He is continuing his feud with a cartoon mouse, yeah. 100%. And we all know um, the only thing that kills a cartoon is dip from Who Framed Roger It's Rabbit. the dip. You need to use the dip. Good movie. Holds up well. Super weird. Um, anyway, uh, you know what I want to do? I'm going to uh, call a little bit of an audible uh, to TD. Can we just swap our next videos? We'll do six and then five. Is that cool? I think it'll just be a little bit easier to pre uh, present it. But we're going to move on to a sort of related concern. Um, why don't we jump right into video six for uh, just an exciting little incident that happened during one of these appearances of Donald Trump? And we've lost people because we supported Jack. Yeah. What were you thinking would do Yeah, well, 
you know, everybody wanted a vaccine at that time. And I was able to do something that nobody else could have done, getting it done very, very rapidly. But I never was for mandates. I was I thought the mandates were terrible. And, and, you know, there's a big portion of the country that thinks that was a great thing. You understand that not a lot of the people in this room, but there's a big but there is a big portion. We lost people because you supported the jab because Donald Trump amidst an absolutely like voluntarily horrendous response to the pandemic did one good thing. The absolute bare minimum that literally any president would have, no matter how many times he says he's the only person that got it done. All he did was put money towards vaccine development. Literally everyone would have done that. It's crazy to assert otherwise. He didn't outright try to stop a vaccine from being developed. And for that, he is being attacked by right wingers who believe that he is in league with Bill Gates and 5G or something. Uh, it's unfair to attack Donald Trump for this because he did actually support the vaccine. He tried to get conservatives to take it after the fact, and he has steadily had to shut up about that. He still wants credit, which is why in that he says lots of but lots of people think it was a good thing. Maybe not you guys, but and he's not wrong. Lots of people think that having vaccines amongst a public health emergency is not a bad thing. But this is this is his legacy, I guess. Uh, Tucker Carlson and others on the right so poisoned the country against vaccines that even Donald Trump is getting attacked in this way. Right? What do you think? I mean, his response is the correct one from his perspective and for his political ends. The the way he you know walks between the raindrops on this is to say, listen, we had to do something. I did something and fast, but I didn't force you to take it. And I never, that's the right answer. And that's the way to appease these folks and be like, oh, that's right. And he redirects them with his jujitsu to basically to the, have them say, that's right. He's a freedom guy. And yeah, I, there's tons of stuff I don't do. But at the same time, uh, that at the same time, that's just counter to uh, a lot of the Republican ethos, which is like, I, I genuinely only want to feel good about myself and angry at other people all the time. And when yeah. it comes to keeping folks alive as a result of the vaccine, they just kind of cherry pick what they what they think is the the main motivator for them at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well they they want to feel that they have access to privileged, awesome information that yeah. the other sheep don't have. And um yeah, they they also have this honest, true anger and fear and resentment towards something like the people who are actually in charge, but they have been very carefully steered away from identifying why they're angry and what should be done to allay that anger. And so they're just always looking for some sort of pressure release. And so I guess the vaccines are the elites. So now all of the anger that I have from you know me and my and, and the rest of working class Americans being left behind by the system can go towards that, I suppose. So I get it. Um, if Trump cared as much about those people and their lives as he does about his own uh, political future, he could say, uh, by the way, um, you know, because I, I, I love and respect all of you, uh, the anti-vaccine stuff is absolutely absurd. I went through COVID. It's not a joke. It's serious. My lungs are Swiss cheese. Thank God for the vaccine. It saved hundreds of thousands of lives and you should all get it. He could say that. He's never going to say that, of course. Yeah. And it does, yeah. it's not what's important to him. Keeping people alive was not important to him. And it's not really Clearly. important to a lot of politicians. The, the most important thing for politicians is to get votes so they can stay in office. And yeah. so he doesn't, it's crazy that keeping people alive doesn't get you the same amount of points as preaching this weird gospel that literally kills people. But it's weird. It, it, that's just a result of what Trump, the poison that Trump kind of uh, pumped into the ecosystem of of discourse on the right. Yeah, um, and it was amplified by just the 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 structure of discourse through social media and uh, a dying cable news mass media delivery mechanism that really just needs to make it spicier and spicier so that um, it actually registers on the taste buds of a of a rabid America. That was evocative. <laughs> uh, by the way, at the same time that Donald Trump is receiving some pushback for his prior support for vaccines, DeSantis, who has tried to differentiate himself from Trump, saying that he was more 
against doing anything about COVID, uh, is now having to face the fact that CNN unearthed a video of him talking about Fauci from 2020. Take a look at this. And you have, and you have a, lot a lot of people there who are working very, very hard, uh, and they're not getting a lot of sleep, and they're really focusing on a big country that we have. And uh, and from from Dr. Burks to Dr. Fauci to the Vice President, who's worked very hard, um, the Surgeon General, uh, they, they they are really doing a good job. Dr. Fauci is really doing a good job. That's very nice of you, Rob DeSantis, to acknowledge that. How big of you to acknowledge that? three years ago and to run from that position ever since once you realized that you needed to remake yourself politically. Uh, I have no doubt that Trump is probably going to use that video against him even though Fauci worked for Trump and continued to months and months and months into the pandemic. Um, but what you saw right there was Ron DeSantis back when he was trying to pitch himself as a more reasonable person. He was in some cases in Florida actually working with the Democrats to get some stuff done. and. Why wouldn't he have that position? For, for some of you who've been following politics every day, you might think, well, it's crazy to acknowledge Fauci. Why would you ever do that? No, the, until we were a year into the pandemic, or not a year, but six months into the pandemic, wanting to stop your people from dying would have been considered good politics. It took a lot of work by Republicans to get their base to accept that no, trying to stop people from dying is woke nonsense and you shouldn't do it. So Ron DeSantis in the beginning was a reasonable governor who was like, yeah, I don't want Floridians to needlessly die. And then he looked out there at the monologues that Tucker Carlson was giving and he saw that Trump was either too lazy or disinterested to do anything about the pandemic. And he realized, oh no, we're actually competing with each other to seem like we're the most willing to pile up a you know, pyramid of skulls of our own constituents. And so he changed and became anti-vax and became anti-Fauci. But you're probably gonna be able to find a lot of stuff like the, that video if you look back then, because this isn't actually who he is, or at least it wasn't a few years ago. Thoughts? There's two aspects of talent. One is natural ability and the other is knowing what to steal. And people yeah. say that a lot, that talent is just knowing what to steal. And and DeSantis is good at the second thing. He's not good at the first thing. He's great at knowing what to steal. And so he started stealing the right things from Trump, but he doesn't have the natural ability to make that look effortless. And the more that we have access to moments like this, that that remind us that the guy was doing stuff that seemed reasonable reasonable before the hubris of a guy who wants to just be president more than anything kicked in and so you know that's that's basically where we're at and and it reminds us that everybody at the time saw how many folks were dying of this disease and it was different than other times viruses came along and folks were really scared like that SARS was going to kill us all. This one stick to, stuck around because it was killing people. And mm -hmm. I saw that there's an interview that Sam Morell, who's like my new favorite comedian and my wife makes fun of me for how into him I am, went on the Joe Rogan podcast and they were having a totally normal conversation until Joe Rogan pointed out that during Sam's specials at the beginning of the pandemic, they had people wearing masks outside. And Sam's response was just like, we didn't know. Like no one knew we were just doing the mm. safe thing because that seemed reasonable at the time. And now it's gotten so hyper political that you have these folks that that just get so mad because they feel so smart when they're saying things that are so stupid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, don't look at the chat because you are being mocked by your wife in the chat about your yeah. love for that comedian who I looked up and I think I found the wrong person. But I'm actually very curious to see oh, the so comedians good. that you're into. I'm gonna have to look into that. Anyway, with that said, we are going to take another break, but we come back. Uh, Bibles are, in fact, as predicted, being banned. We'll break it down after this. Okay, uh, by the way, oh, where is it? There is a good, co oh, um, Lovely Pariah says, also liked Mrs. Davis. So that's cool. Looks like an interesting show. And uh, that actress is really good. Okay, with that said, uh, why don't we jump into some more news with the time we have remaining. Utah officials have apparently pulled the Bible from all elementary and middle school libraries in Davis school districts due to the fact that the Bible contains vulgarity or violence. And this is, I think, for a lot of people gonna be a very controversial decision. 
But what isn't controversial is that it, it contains a lot of violence. It historically contains quite a bit of violence. Vulgarity is a little bit more vague of a term, but I think that it could be applied there. Anyway, there's a committee that's tasked with reviewing books that have been flagged for sensitive material because that's the country we live in right now. And so Christopher Williams, the director of communication for Davis School District says that the review committee quote decided to retain the book in school library circulation only at the high school level based on age appropriateness due to vulgarity or violence. So they said after reviewing, it's not so messed up in what it contains that it should be pulled from literally everyone. The older kids can still see it, but the younger people, not necessarily. Uh, by the way, the Sensitive Materials in Schools Act, which was passed last year, bans books with pornographic or indecent material from schools and school libraries. The parent who initially complained about the, the Bible said that it contains incest, onanism, bestiality, prostitution, genital mutilation, fellatio, dildos, rape, and infanticide. I have not read the entire Bible, but certainly a lot of that seems to check out. Brett, what do you think about this decision? Oh my God. I The fellatio, I was uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm I'm not I'm not familiar with that section of the Bible, but I'm trying to feverishly Ephesians declares don't but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity because these are improper for God's holy people. Any form of sexual contact outside of marriage, I don't know. I'm looking for it. Can't find it. I was I was really worried for a second that you had found it. Anyway, um it, apparently enough is in there. Now, look, the committee could be just doing its job, a job it shouldn't have to do, but does, according to the law, have to do. Uh, it could be that, like with some parents who are making these, you know, like claims against the Bible, that it's designed to send a signal that, like, hey, maybe going around pulling tons of books just because we're briefly angry about them or looking to be angry about something isn't the best way. For a country to run, I don't know for sure. What do you think the effects will be of them doing this uh, pulling? Um, pulling Sorry, it out, pulling of the books, pulling out. Just... They pulled out. Uh, I, this is a, this is hopefully the effect is to take all these lunatics who want to ban books and remind them that like this rule you came up with actually makes it harder for you to accomplish your own goal of Christianizing and untransing America. Your rule as written, unless you add except for the Bible into the letter of your rule, makes the Bible completely exposes the Bible for what it it is, which is a, a book with a lot of really good lessons in it that are frequently taught through genocide. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, don't enslave the Hebrews. Or we're going to kill all the babies in Egypt, the firstborn babies in Egypt. Don't have premarital sex because God's going to kill everyone except the animals with a flood. Mm -hmm. And as I'm discovering. Oh, God. You know, Judah said unto Onan, go into thy go unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up thy seed, the, raise up seed to thy brother. And Odin knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it onto the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore, God killed him for spilling his wow. seed onto the floor, That's not for doing stuff with his dead brother's wife i i get what they're trying to communicate swallow with the, i guess is what is how people oh my that. god so when they say like it displeased the lord they mean morally but the way i picture that is the lord's like oh just seems weird but anyway look the the bible is obviously very serious to a lot of people a lot of people who could be very serious about the bible so I assume there's going to be some pushback against this. So far as I've seen, Fox doesn't seem to have picked this up. I get because maybe they don't want to get their base to start to think about like, oh, wait, if we start a trend of banning any book that we pretend to have an issue with, that's a blade that can cut both ways. Um, but anyway, if you start to see this happening in more areas, perhaps.
Perhaps. I just hate having to reason with people like this. Just be like, and. People who are inherently unreasonable. So you're saying yeah. that if there's sexual activity or murder or uh, any any weird sodomy per se in mm -hmm. a book, we should get rid of the book. Mm -hmm. And where did sodomy get invented? Why do you know? Oh, okay. and they'll be like, but yes. it's the Bible. Exactly. I can't well, reason because again, no, we, we, yeah, we got we got to wrap it up. But yeah, it, because it's, because it's not about principles. It's not designed to be applied equally. It's designed to enforce legally superiority between other groups. Yeah. That's what it's designed to do. Uh, but it doesn't always work that out that way. Okay, we are running out of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to run and uh, jump into this last story, starting with this. This is an H car, chambered in 30 out six. It's legal if you pass the background check. Just because you pass that doesn't mean you should have it. As for what goes in it. So these are armor piercing 30 out six rounds, 500 of them. And you can get a gun that just, you put it in, rack it, and it doesn't stop until this is empty. The issue is that there's no training. As a father? What stops this from being used against my kid? And that's the problem I have. That right there is uh, John Waldman, who opened a gun store, Georgia Ballistics in Duluth in March 2021. And he is shutting it down, as you saw in that video, because he is worried that the guns that he sells will be used on kids. And there's just been too many shootings recently. There was obviously the Nashville, Tennessee shooting at a Christian school, another shooting at Atlanta Hospital. Those are both cited by Waldman as influences to get him to shut down his gun store. But also some of the behavior that he's actually seen from customers who've come to his store. Take a look at this. This is an H car, chambered in 30 odd six. It's legal if you pass the background check. Just because you pass that doesn't mean you should have it. As for what goes in it. So these are armor piercing 30 odd six rounds, 500 of them. And you can get a gun that just, you put it in, rack it, and it doesn't stop until this is empty. The issue is that there's no training. As a father? What stops this from being used against my kid? And that's the problem I have. Yeah, uh, nothing. Nothing stops them clearly from being used against kids or you know people in bars or sporting events or casinos or churches or whatever. Nothing stops them. Certainly not our government doesn't stop them. Um, he he mentioned there. If I can disagree just a little bit with uh, John Waldman, who's doing a good thing by you know pulling out if he doesn't feel comfortable and having this store anymore. He says um, there's the problem is there's not training. That is one problem with the gun and the ammo that he just showed. The other problem is that it is available to civilians at all because I do not suddenly become comfortable with people having, you know, magazine or like belt fed hundred clips of armor piercing ammunition just because they're trained for it. There's no reason to have it. There's no self defense. There's no hunting. There's no target practice that requires that sort of ammunition. That's my position. But other than that, it is interesting. I, I like that he's shutting down the, the store now. A lot of people will respond to this. I think, Brett, and I'm curious about your thoughts that, well, you know, in 2001, when he opened up the store, we'd already had a lot of shootings, including in schools at that point. But I, I like that people can continue to learn and grow. And if we take his story at face value, that appears to be what he's doing. What do you think? Listen, when I started on this show, Today, when this show started, I was of the opinion that assault rifles were necessary for hunting only. And because of that, we should replace our arms with AR-15s and our legs with bazookas. But then this guy pointed out that children are killed in mass shootings with assault weapons. And only now am I coming around to it. Even if that was the case, we should be supportive. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. supportive of people who, even if they had the staunchest non-me opinions, when they come around to having opinions that sound as reasonable as this guy, I just go, yeah. welcome. Thank you. Great idea. More like you. I like that. I agree. John Waldman, welcome. Thank you. More like you. Okay, everyone, that is unfortunately all the time we have uh, for this first hour, but we do have more like of that coming up in the aftermath, including the throwing away of the Garbage People of the Week. So we'll see you in just a few.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.